This rapid review is going to focus on the loanable funds model, and it's going to give us a good chance to see how each of our models we can look at in three different ways. So we're going to look at the loanable funds model first using algebra, then we're going to look at it using geometry, drawing graphs, and finally we're going to think about what it means in words and how to use that to uh, interpret and solve some problems. So we'll start with the algebra. Our starting point for the loanable funds model is our uh, national income accounting equation for GDP. So we have real GDP is the sum of consumption expenditures, uh, investment expenditures, government purchases, and net exports. But in our first pass of the loanable funds model, we're focusing on a closed economy. So that tells you there are no net exports. So we can just sort of cross this out. Net exports are zero. So then the starting point for the loanable funds model was to basically just reinterpret this equation. We're going to move some stuff to the left-hand side, leave investment on the right-hand side, and reinterpret the equation. So let's move everything but investment to the left-hand side. So we'll subtract C and G from both sides, and that leaves just investment on the right side. We call this Y minus C minus G saving, and as you remember, uh, it's really composed of two parts, public saving and private saving. But here we've sort of added the two together and we just have national saving. Uh, and this is our loanable funds equilibrium. We can just write it as S equals I. In equilibrium, the supply of savings is going to match demand for loans, uh, which is investment. But I think it's helpful to write this slightly differently as S of R equals I of R. So S is a function of the interest rate, I is a function of the interest rate, because this helps to reinforce that the point of this equation, the use of this equation, is to solve for the equilibrium interest rate. So we have demand that depends on the interest rate on the right, we have supply that depends on the interest rate on the left, and then in equilibrium, supply is going to equal demand, and we'll have um, an interest rate that balances the two. Let's look at how that looks on a diagram. So here we're going to look at the geometry of the loanable funds model. So we'll start by drawing our axes. We have R, as we said, is the price we're trying to determine. So that's going to be on the vertical. And then the horizontal is the quantity of loanable funds, which you can think of as either the quantity, the amount saved, or the amount invested. Although we know in equilibrium, the two will match. So it's not really that important which one we use to label. So we'll start by drawing in the demand curve. As you remember from micro, demand curves slope down, so investment slopes down uh, along with the interest rate. You should be able to make intuitive sense of this. If interest rates are really high, then firms are going to have to pay really high interest rates in order to borrow funds and build new factories, so they're not going to want to do much of that. As interest rates get lower and lower, there's less of a cost for investment, so firms are going to borrow more money and do more investment. The supply curve, sometimes we say as a sort of simplified model, it might just be vertical. There's a fixed amount of saving. But I think more realistically, the, the amount of saving will increase as the interest rate goes up. I would certainly save more as interest rates go up. So we'll draw supply as somewhat upward sloping. So we have saving here. And this is the geometry interpretation of the loanable funds model. It's the same thing as on the previous slide. It's focusing on these two equations, one for saving, one for investment, and where they're equal to each other, this point here, which we'll label A, um, but now interpreted in terms of a graph, in terms of the geometry. And we can use these graphs for comparative statics. That's the most common use. So let's suppose, for example, that uh, government purchases increase. So suppose G goes up. Then we'd have to think in terms of the graph, what's going to change? So government purposes really don't have anything to do with investment, that uh, firms are just deciding how much to invest, and that gives us our demand curve, our investment schedule. So does government purchases have something to do with savings? And then we remember, yeah, it does. Public saving is T minus G. So if G goes up, there's going to be less public saving, and that will presumably reduce national saving. So that would be basically, in terms of the graph, um, a leftward shift, a decrease in savings. So we'll draw that here. We'll shift the supply curve to the left. We get a new savings here, and we get point B. So this diagram shows that we had an initial equilibrium at A, then the government purchases increased, public saving drop, shifting S to the left, and we get a new equilibrium B, which uh, has a higher interest rate and less saving and less investment.
So that's the kind of typical comparative static exercise we use these diagrams for. The last thing we'd like to do is sort of think about the loanable funds model in words. And in some ways we've been doing that already. We've been talking about you know, sort of how to interpret the diagram, how to interpret the algebra, and how the two are really representing the same thing. But now we're going to do a practice problem where we really have to interpret what's going on in the problem, just given in words, in terms of the model. So the problem says, the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act incentivize firms to accumulate more capital while also cutting taxes. Do comparative statics for the LF, loanable funds market. So it wants us to do comparative statics. So presumably, uh, the, the, the main thing we really want to do here is draw a graph and then, as on the previous slide, do comparative statics. So we can start out by drawing sort of a picture. We'll have our uh, uh, axes labeled. We'll have our initial investment and initial saving. And now, well, the real trick for, for doing this kind of analysis is to take what's given as words and reinterpret them in terms of something that's going to happen with the geometry or something that'll happen with the algebra. Here it's focused on the graph, so we'll think about the geometry. So we have this phrase, incentivized to accumulate more capital. So I'll just put in quotes, accumulate more capital, K. Usually use K for capital. So firms are going to accumulate more capital. What does that have to do with savings or investment? And upon a little reflection, you think, oh, well, how do you get more capital? Well, you borrow money and then build factories and we call that process investment. So accumulating more capital means firms are going to have to do more investment. So this is basically code for um, do more investment, do more I. So in terms of the graph, that would be I shifting to the right. So one thing that we were described above was uh, investment shifting to the right. And I'll draw that in, but we're not quite ready yet because we were told about more stuff that the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act did. It said firms to accumulate more capital while also cutting taxes. So this bill cut taxes, which means T went down, right? Cut taxes, sort of code for uh, T going down. And then if T goes down, we think back to the previous slide, public saving T minus G is part of overall saving. And if public saving here decreased because T went down, it's just like on the previous slide, we're going to have S shifting to the left. I should say it, it sort of looks on the graph like the previous slide because public savings decreasing. But the reason public saving decreased here was because of changes in taxes. On the previous slide, the reason it changed was because of changes in government spending. All right, so now we have our two curves we need to shift in order to do the comparative statics. So let me label this point A, our initial equilibrium, just so I don't forget where that was. And now I'm going to shift um, investment out a little bit to represent that increase in investment. I'm going to shift savings back because we are told uh, saving public saving decrease, so saving overall decreases. And now I get my new equilibrium point B. So I can do comparative statics here, and I see that interest rates went up quite dramatically from point A to B, and total saving and total investment decreased. Um, but now I want you to reflect on this. You know, When you did this exercise, did your graph look like this? Uh, or maybe it looked slightly differently. And um, if you think back to what you learned in you know, micro in EC 101, you might realize, you know, whenever two curves shift, there's usually some ambiguities. Either the price change is ambiguous or the quantity change is ambiguous. So let's delve deeper into looking at that. And uh, what we're going to do is draw another graph to show the changes in saving and investment. And then we're going to compare it to the graph we drew earlier. So suppose we have, you know, S shifting back like this. Here's our initial code from A. I should label that. Then we have investment shifting out here. So our new points are A and B. And it, it, it doesn't look like it changed much, but there was definitely an increase in saving and investment in the right-hand graph and a decrease in the left-hand graph. So you might ask, you know, is one of these graphs wrong? And the answer is no, they're both, you know, fine. They're both consistent with S shifting left, I shifting right. What the graphs are really telling us is that as we were sort of intuiting from intro micro, if you have multiple curve shifts, sometimes changes are going to be ambiguous. Both graphs show, and it's unambiguous, that the interest rate is going to go up. But it's ambiguous whether saving or an, an investment are going to increase or decrease. And you should be aware of that when you do this type of analysis. We're building on 
fundamental economics you learned before so you can't forget about that stuff. Thanks for watching.